on the fourth night. Every winter in the North Atlantic, a great sheet of ice forms. This one had been reported as being 400 miles from the top to the bottom and about 300 miles across. They knew they were going to go into that. And they also knew that those ice sheets are sometimes interspersed with bigger blocks of ice known as icebergs. But they were pretty confident. Many other ships had just passed through. And so late that night, at about half past nine, a light flashed out of the darkness. And on the Titanic, they swung the signal lamp and replied, G -g -g -g, go ahead. And the signal came back in Morse code. Titanic, this is SS Rapanahok, east bound. Have just traversed large sheet of ice. Have sustained some rudder damage. Am able to proceed. And on the Titanic, they just said, thank you, Titanic. Thank you and good night. Not the least concerned. And on went the ship. At half past ten that night, Jack Phillips took his headphones off, threw them down angrily because his, ear, his ear, eardrums were nearly burst as a ship very close by started to transmit. Titanic, this is SS Californian. Keep out, keep out, says Jack Phillips. I'm busy working Cape Race. Keep out, I'm busy. But the operator on the Californian insisted and he blasted out this message, an ice warning. And he said, we are hove to, completely surrounded by ice. And Jack Phillips said, just rogered that. And the man on the Californian, he thought, well, it's getting on towards 11 o'clock. They're not taking any notice of me. I'm going to go to bed. Now, he was on watch by himself. There were no other radio operators on that ship. So he just hung his headphones on the back of a door, pulled out a canvas bunk and a blanket and lay down. And within about 20 minutes or so after that, the drama unfolded. The Californian was believed to be only about 10 to 12 miles away while this was happening. The watch changed and onto the bridge came Mr Murdoch, the first officer, Lieutenant Moody, and on the wheel, a very experienced sailor called Abel Seaman Hitchens. They just exchanged the details of the watch, look out for ice and this type of thing. But they were pretty confident because they had six lookouts on the ship, always two on, four off. And at that mo moment, a fellow called Lee, another fellow called Fleet, Freddie Fleet, were up in the crow's nest, freezing cold, 60, 60 feet higher than the bridge, stamping their feet, trying to keep. And they're in this little cast iron box. You can imagine what it was like. And the, the wind, as the ship's going, which is about 40 kilometres an hour, you can imagine icy wind going by your face. Lee, of course, is crouched right out. He's saying, you take it, Freddie, you have a look. Freddie Fleet's looking and he's wondering, what happened to the binoculars? Oh, well, just have to look. So he's looking out. It was so clear that night. The sea was so smooth, it was like a mirror. They reckon it's never been quite that calm since. It was just like a mirror. There were a million stars shining above and the stars seemed to come down, almost meet the water. But there was a slight haze on the horizon. Freddie Fleet's looking. Ship's coming, speeding along, a great weight going up for miles behind the ship. Big bow wave coming up. And he's looking and he's thinking, gee, we must be coming up to that towards that ice. I can smell it. I can smell it. And he's looking. Suddenly something started to happen, which he, he found uncanny. In front of him, all those stars were suddenly being blacked out. He looked. It was missed. He looked again. He looked again. He rang the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Went to the telephone. <laughs> bridge, bridge. On the bridge, they just strolled around. Yes, look out. Iceberg, sir. Iceberg. Dead ahead. 
Can you imagine what they did? Dead ahead, what will we do? Will we go left, will we go right? A moment of hesitation and then harder starboard, Abel Seaman Hitchens swung the wheel up this way to port. Why? Because in those days, harder starboard went starboard helm up. So he swung this way. And the ship should have turned to the left. But 46,000 tonnes moving at 23 knots doesn't turn like a mini miner in a car park. It just kept going. Now they could see the iceberg right ahead of them. Now it was getting closer and closer. Would they make it? No, they were going to hit it. Full ahead, full of stern, both engines, ding, ding, they ran down the telegraph. Can you imagine down below? The, the telegraph, which had been on full ahead for days, suddenly goes clang, clang, clang. The engineer looks at it, full of stern. So they stop the engines, and of course the ship keeps going. Now the iceberg's very close, but now the ship is turning very, very slowly, very slowly to the left. Round it comes, round it comes. They're going to miss it. They're going to miss it. They see the iceberg flash by on the starboard side. A bit of it strikes a mast and some ice falls off onto the deck, but they're past. Even as they're breathing a sigh of relief, they feel just a shudder like that. A few tinkling of glasses on the table in first class and they're past. And they just carry on talking. People go up on deck and look at the ice that's fallen down. Eventually, the ship, under its moment, own momentum, comes to a halt. Engines stopped. Now, when those engines stopped, certain people woke up because you get that vroom, 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 as the engine's turning over, and that, that had gone. So Captain Edward J. Smith was the first on the bridge. What's the problem, Mr Murdoch? Uh, we've struck a bird, sir, and uh, I've order I'm ordering all watertight doors closed. And as he pressed the button, clang, 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 down below, the doors are descending. Down below, of course, later at, at the inquiry, a fellow called Jack Podeska was asked, what actually happened? What did you hear when you hit the bird? And he said, sir, it was just like someone was tearing a strip of calico. But it wasn't a strip of calico being torn. Half a million tonnes scraping against 46,000 tonnes, inch thick plates, brittle with cold. It put a series of punctures about 300 feet along the starboard side of the ship. Didn't rip it open like a tin opener, but just lots and lots of little puncture marks all the way along. Six compartments. The water didn't just trickle in, it didn't pour in, it shot in almost as if it was under pressure from hoses all along the, the ship. Within a few minutes, the water was up around boiler room six, up around their knees. They could see the doors coming down, ding, 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 ding. They jumped into the next boiler room, but even in there, the water was already inches deep. The stokers, of course, tried to make their way out at this stage. As I said, the ship was stationary. Captain Edward J. Smith was on the bridge. Captain Smith was a legend. He'd been at sea since he was 16. He'd been a captain at 25 years of age. He'd been with a White Star Line. And this was his last trip before they retired him. He was the Commodore of the Line and a great personality. And they felt, well, if Captain Smith's in charge, everything's OK. Well, another man woke up on that ship, a fellow by the name of Thomas Andrews. Thomas Andrews was the managing director of Harland and Wolfe. And Thomas Andrews had been the man who'd actually had a hand in designing the ship and overseeing it being built. And he knew all about it. And he thought he'd go down and have a look what was going on. Already, Captain Smith had sent Lieutenant Boxall and the, and the carpenter below to sound the ship. And they'd come back and said it was all right. Andrews didn't believe it. 
he went down below himself. Straight away he saw that in the mail room, the mail room was already flooded. They were pushing the mail bags up into the next level. So he went back to his cabin. He had been a first class, first class cabin person with a big desk. He got out of the blueprints and he started doing some calculations. Now I don't know whether he had a slide rule, I don't even know whether they were invented then, but he, he would have had some method of working out how fast the ship was sinking. He then made his way onto the bridge. Uh, Captain Smith, sir. Yes, yes, what is it, Andrew? Uh, Captain Smith, this ship is doomed. What? What did you say, Andrew? This ship is doomed. It has about an hour, maybe two hours in which to live. Can you imagine how the captain felt? He knew that there were over 2,000 people on that ship and he knew that they carried lifeboats for only approximately half of them. Why? Because some idiot in a, bo in a, a boardroom had made a decision that they would never, lead, never need all the, the lifeboats which were originally designed for the ship. It was originally designed to take lifeboats to carry 3,400 people, one boat within another. But they said, oh, we won't, we won't need those. Take them off. They're cluttering up the boat deck. People like to stroll around up there. And so they had enough boats for half the people. Captain Edward J. Smith knew that. He knew they had to get help quickly. So he went along to the radio room, wrote out a message very quickly, said, Jack, get this away quick. Well, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride were at the Morse Keys. They looked and they thought the captain was joking. The captain had gone out. Hey, Jack, have a look at this. This is a CQD message. All right, well, he's a skipper. You better send it off. And so the message went out. 